Okay. Um, yeah, I can pray and then I'll start off. All right. Okay. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for this time where we can come together to learn more about the world that you've given us, uh, how we can uh, think about it, what, what the proper way to think about your creation is, and how we can defend our faith in a uh, doubting world. Thank you again. We love you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. So, yeah, this week we're continuing on in our series on the philosophy of science. Uh, today we're talking about the history, foundations, and applications of science. Um, so, last week, oh, and these are some of our sources. Uh, <laughs> yeah, here, sorry, this was me. Um, I just wanted to be better about my sources, so I decided to put them up here. Most of what I'm going to be teaching, at least, comes from Del Rash's book, Science and Its Limits. It's a professor at Calvin, excellent book on um, what science can actually tell you from a Christian's perspective. And then uh, C.S. Lewis's Miracles, it's a classic. Um, kind of actually the same thing. Yeah, sorry. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so we'll start out with our recap. All right, cool. So um, I, I think everyone was here last week, mm -hmm. right? Is that okay, yeah. cool. So I can just go through it quickly then. Um, oh, you weren't here, sorry. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to go very slow then. And I'm sit through it. <laughs> but, um, okay, so, so we talked about deductive, inductive reasoning, um, briefly talked about how this can become combined as well. So um, I think it's going to be best just to slow down and go through an example of both, because I think we, we kind of get the gist of where it came from from last week. But um, Deductive reasoning, like we claimed last week, it's provable. Um, it, you, you can actually find the truth through deductive reasoning, mm -hmm. whereas inductive reasoning wouldn't be. All of deductive reasoning comes in a very specific formula. It's A plus B equals C. And A plus B have to be true and mutually exclusive, is what it's called, for C to be true as well. Um, so uh, and it's definitional by, yeah. by its, the way it's set up. So you're breaking down generalities into specifics. Right, exactly. So um, the classic example is like shapes. So if you look at, if you say that a shape with three sides is a triangle, you can posit that as a hypothesis or something that's true as a definition. Um, you would write out the definitional phrase or the deductive phrase like this. You would say um, a triangle is a shape with three sides. And you say this is a shape with three sides. Therefore, this is a triangle, right? And that's 100% provable as long as we define a triangle as this way. Interestingly, this can even apply to God. So some people will ask, um, can God make a triangle with four sides? And that's really a bad question because a triangle is just what we call this thing. So sure, you can make a shape with four sides, but we would just call it something different. Yeah. yeah. Right. And often when you see an argument like that, like, well, is God so powerful that he can create an immovable object uh, but then would God be able to move that immovable yeah. object? Right. It's a nonsensical argument, right? right. It's like saying, right. well, who's more powerful if I win an argument, if I win a arm wrestling match with myself? It, right. it just, it doesn't make it's sense. not worth yeah. reasoning about. Right, yeah, and, it, and if you really break that one down too, you're asking, <laughs> can God do something that he can't do? Which is like, of course God can't do something <laughs> that he can't do, so. Um, but yeah, so that's the inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning would be um, observation-based. So. Um, I found an example, and I, I can't remember where I got this from, but it either came from a book by N.T. Wright or um, I think a Jordan Peterson podcast, so those are very different sources, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it might be true, it might not be, but it, it, does, the, it does the point here. So um, the, the claim is that in Western Europe, before Darwin came to the Americas, um, there was a specific bird that they studied, and that bird was always white, all right? So they would have uh, posited a deductive reason for this bird like this, it would be that if you have this bird, all these birds are white. Therefore, if you find one of these birds in the wild, it will be white, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So that's a, that's a deductive statement. But the assumptions were wrong, okay? Because yep. when Darwin went to the Galapagos Islands, he found one that was black. And then, so what you can see there is that's not really deductive, that's inductive. So he was making an observation. Um, what would have been a better approach would to be pose a hypothesis, like if bird A, if, if we find this bird, then the bird will be white, then you would test it by looking at a bunch of those birds. Mm -hmm. And if you found one that was black, then you would reject the hypothesis, right? Yep. So that's inductive reasoning, not deductive reasoning. Um, in conclusion, if we look at both of these separately, deductive reasoning can prove something, 100% to be true, this is a triangle. 
right? But it doesn't get you very far. Because as we said before, really the only deductive statement you can make by itself is that you exist. I think therefore I am, as Descartes famously said. Mm -hmm. um, inductive reasoning can get you very far, as Kyle's about to say in the next couple slides here, but you can't prove any of it. It's not inherently provable. <laughs> so those, that's kind of where we're at with reasoning. We're going to start to break down the different systems that people have created to really see how we can apply these two different approaches. Probably one of the best examples was Galileo to prove the speed of falling out. You know, they always yeah. thought, well, a heavier object will fall faster than a lot of other. Right. And, a, and an object gains speed as it falls, it keeps going faster. Because a horse runs faster as it gets close to the barn, so therefore a falling out and it goes faster as it gets close to the earth. I mean, uh -huh. it, it, faulty logic to begin with, and yeah. so, and nobody tested it. Nobody dropped two objects to see how long they took right. to get to the ground. Yeah, exactly. So that's exactly. your inductive, and it, it'll, it'll leave you the wrong place is where it'll lead you. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, great, um, great setup. Yeah, exactly. And so going into our uh, thing, <laughs> the <laughs> most well-known uh, systematic like methodology or system is called the scientific method. And there's kind of a rich history involved with it. Um, I'll just first start out by describing what the scientific method is. So first of all, it's an empirical method uh, which can be used for the discovery of knowledge. So inductive reasoning. Of, of new knowledge, yep, yep. using inductive reasoning. Uh, and it starts out with a, well, and it is a cycle of learning, so mm -hmm. to speak. So it starts out with an observation or question, which then you take that, you research the topic area or the uh, surrounding uh, concepts that would be related to your observation or question. You form a hypothesis, which is a reason uh, why, uh, you, a plausible explanation for why things are happening, why your observation would occur. Then you start testing it with uh, experiments. You then analyze the results of those experiments, and then you report your conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this actually comes from uh, Aristotle, yeah. believe it or not. So Aristotle had a method, a uh, personal system, of making logical inductions towards generalities. Uh, the problem is, of course, and then, of course, deductions from those generalities. Mm -hmm. The problem with uh, Aristotle's view in this particular case was that he um, he did not do much experimentation. Mm -hmm. He primarily <laughs> just went around observing things, which was really, really great for certain things that you can observe, like biology and whatever else. He, uh, he made quite a few discoveries with respect to that. However, um, if you're not going to experiment and you're not going to hypothesize, and all you can do is observe, then that might lead you in the wrong direction, as per like yeah. Wade's example with Galileo. That's a great um, example. So, of course, the first half of the scientific method is about using deductions to form testable explanations for ideas. These are known as hypotheses. Um, features of a good hypothesis are that it provides an underlying explanation for observation. It must be falsifiable, mm -hmm. uh, so you must be able to show by testing that your hypothesis <coughs> is wrong. Like, <laughs> for, for example, like if it's, it yeah. could be white or it could be black, so if your hypothesis is that it's white, it can be disproven <coughs> that it's black. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then it must be consistent with already known scientific facts. Uh, if you're going to accept certain things as true, then it doesn't make sense to form a hypothesis that would try to show that those things are not actually true. Um, and then the second half uses inductive reasoning uh, and testing to then form conclusions about uh, your hypothesis. Um, so methods of testing, of course, vary drastically from field to field. Uh, for example, biologists like use <coughs> microscopes and invent you know, new technology, but physicists use particle accelerators nowadays and statistics, mm -hmm. which was not common, say, in uh, early <coughs> physics days with Isaac Newton. He didn't mm -hmm. have access to the technology that we have nowadays. And so methods of testing and uh, technology is a really, really big factor um, with respect to that. Together they form a cycle where questions can be answered through lots of testing and logical inductions from those tests. So uh, the idea is we're going to observe things, we're not going to trust necessarily our premises, we're going to observe things that we know exist in the world, we're going to come up with reasons potential reasons for why those exist, and then we're going to find <coughs> ways of testing whether those reasons are valid or not. Um, so now, where did it come from? Well, the probably the, uh, I would argue, the biggest aspect of this was actually the printing press. <laughs> because 
as you know, there's this one big step here called report conclusions. Um, how is a scientific community going to be built if you have no way to actually genuinely report and disseminate your conclusions <coughs> through time and space? That's fascinating. Yeah, it's fascinating. So the printing press came about in the 1400s. Uh, Aristotle, of course, was what, like 300 BC, yeah, something like much that? Before that. <laughs> uh, way, way before that. But there wasn't much scientific progress between Aristotle and uh, the Enlightenment age. And the Enlightenment age really genuinely started with the printing press in the, in the 1400s. Um, uh, there's another interesting note about that. So, uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, so single largest contribution to the development and implementation of the scientific method primarily because it allowed people to read what was known before them and also then you know internalize that and then add to it. So you have this whole massive corpus of information that's getting built up and built up and built up and hopefully not lost to the ages um, as has happened with a lot, a lot of scientific knowledge over the days that is only now being recovered <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> through archaeology and, and whatever else. So um, it, of course, uh, uh, many people throughout, period, uh, throughout time had mm -hmm. developed methods or processes for their own scientific method, uh, but their writings could not be easily reproduced or disseminated, um, and they were lost to history. Some examples of these are actually Aristotle himself, um, or uh, a uh, Muslim um, named Ibn al uh, Haytham. Haytham? That's right, yeah. Yeah, no, something, something like that. <laughs> so um, they all had their own sort of methodology. Of course, there all are uh, limitations involved. And then this is why we didn't see such an explosion of growth until uh, the 16th century. Of course, technology is also involved in that um, mm -hmm. technology and agriculture and uh, uh, how, would I, how would I put it, city running, city building, <laughs> as far as like politics and such are also large factors. So, and you gotta remember, people didn't have the money or connections to be philosophers and scientists for most of the time, <laughs> until for most of the history. So you had to convince someone who was rich and powerful to let you do that. Hmm. And so then that also <laughs> will indicate why maybe um, people weren't as uh, forthcoming with their knowledge until the printing press came around. Hmm. Anyway, Aristotle, he lived uh, 384 to 322 BC. See, I have it in my notes. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned before, he developed a personal system where, uh, of, of learning where he would make inductions to generalizations. So he would say you could only make an induction if that generalization was universally true. If it was always true and did not depend on context, that's how he felt safe in making inductions. Um, of course, the problem there, oh, and here's an example. He'll say, like, all men are mortal. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so all, like, here's an example of one of his uh, deductions that he would do, and then I would say, I'll, I'll tell you what that means about his induction. So, all <coughs> men are mortal. Aristotle is a man. Therefore, Aristotle is mortal. Um, according to Aristotle, you could infer that all men are mortal by observing that all men die. However, you could not directly infer that Aristotle is mortal simply because you observe Aristotle dying. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a, of a weird thing, right? It's possibly not universal, um, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is an interesting thing. And so, of course, Aristotle being one of the largest uh, philosophers of the age, this was the prevailing theory. And also, you have a little... Um, interesting uh, quirk with the uh, Catholic Church and some of their uh, oh, yeah. understandings, or may maybe not understanding, some of their hesitancies <coughs> around adopting Greek philosopher uh, um, knowledge. Uh, anyway, so things kind of stay the same, mostly the same, until right around uh, 18, the, the, sorry, the 1500s, 1500s. Uh, where Francis Bacon comes along and he uh, I would say he codifies a lot of the thoughts that are going on at the time. Uh, he's not necessarily the inventor of all of these thoughts, but uh, he really does come together and uh, is generally known as the father of empiricism. It's good to say that. Yeah, so he lived 1561 to 1626 AD, <clears throat> uh, and he's known as the father of empiricism. Here's a quote. 
Uh, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. Mm -hmm. So his uh, idea was um, that Aristotle's methods were too limited. He thought that uh, another <coughs> form of induction must be devised that has hitherto been employed. This is another quote from Francis Bacon. And it must be used for proving and discovering not first principles, as they're called only, but also the lesser axioms and the middle, and indeed all, for the induction which proceeds by simple enumeration is childish. And so, in English. Yeah. Yeah, so his point is you must be able to infer about things that are not universals. You must be able to infer right. about things that are in the middle of all the stuff that you want to prove. So, because Aristotle's logic was you can only prove things by deduction. You need to prove your universals first, and then if you prove all the universals, you can deduce from those down mm -hmm. to all the minutiae that you want to learn. So that's a great point because we were talking about that last week with Descartes. Because remember, mm -hmm. Descartes tried to prove things by reason alone, deduction, and his explanation was that like I can't even prove that the real world exists in front of me because I could be demon possessed and I could be hallucinating, mm -hmm. right? So he said, well, I can define who I am by that I think. If I think, I exist. And since uh, I can think, I exist, right? <coughs> and he said that is all we can know from reason alone. So Francis Bacon, as you're saying very well, kind of came along with another approach to say, well, that doesn't really get us anywhere. Well, let's, let's try this thing out here, you know, use yeah. induction. Yep, exactly. And so his point was you don't just need to make, be able to make inductions about big universals like all men are mortal, mm -hmm. but rather you should be able to make an induction like Aristotle is mortal, right. something that's in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so to fix this problem, he devised a method that he called experimental histories, uh, and he used those to eliminate alternative theories. Um, so for example, in a study of nature, in the nature of heat, he constructed two tables or spreadsheets, <laughs> like literally spreadsheets, um, so. one of presence <laughs> and one of absence. Uh, so then experiments were devised to then uh, collect histories of these tables and compile them into the presence of heat and the absence of heat tables. And then he would compare them against each other and then find out where new critical histories needed to be devised, um, which would then help either resolve conflicts between the two tables or missing data in, in them. Um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, this should also sound really familiar, that kind of approach, because post-enlightenment, that's why we've done science for, for history. Yeah. So, it should sound familiar. Yeah, exactly. Um, pretty interesting. Of course, there is a flaw to this, which is he's not hypothesizing much. Francis Bacon didn't hypothesize too much. He instead would, again, observe, but he was a little better about his observances hmm. in terms of being able to look at what he's already observed, find missing pieces, and then try to observe those and then make inductions from what he uh, had observed, um, what he had tested. And he had a heavy emphasis on experimentation. This is why he's making alternate histories, so to speak. Um, of course, uh, probably one of the best known scientists of all time, Isaac Newton, came along and uh, I don't know necessarily that he invented it per se. I don't know um, that he uh, invented the idea of hypothesizing, but he was very, very well known for his use of thought experiments in uh, his reasoning. Uh, of course, the most famous one is uh, in his discovery of the law of gravity. He was sitting under an apple tree and he was looking at celestial objects, trying to figure out what keeps them in the orbits that, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Not starts with a C. <laughs> Uh, Copernicus. Copernicus, yeah, that Copernicus had proven the, the orbits of all the, the stars and, and, and planets in the solar system, oh, stars in the solar system, planets in the solar system, and he uh, was trying to figure out why they worked that way, apple fell on his head, as far as the legend goes, and he's like, oh, gravity. <laughs> um, Newton probably gained, gained credibility because of his expertise as mathematician. I mean, you yeah, can argue yeah. with math. Oh, yeah, 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 right. yeah for oh. sure, for sure. And that was definitely a tool he used to help prove um, some of his inductions. <laughs> yeah. 
out. Uh, so anyway, so he reinforced Bacon's method by expanding on it with four additional rules of reasoning. Uh, one, you can only, and these are not the, the quotes, the quotes that he had in his book. He wrote a book called uh, like um, Rules of Philosophy or something along those lines. Um, and it uses Old English and is kind of hard to understand. So I tried to uh, make it understandable. Uh, first rule, you can only use the causes that are needed to explain something. Second rule, if you observe the same effect, then it must have the same cause. Uh, three qualities which belong uh, to all materials within our reach and are without dimension must then belong to all materials, i.e. like matter and energy are the same here as anywhere. And if you discover a particular quality about them, uh, that quality will be the same here as everywhere. <laughs> That's a very key point. With that is a time. very key point. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then inductions derived from experimentation should be considered very accurate until we come up with a hypothesis which is more accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so AKA, take the best explanation until there's a better one. Mm -hmm. um, these rules were intended to encourage empirical methods by eliminating some of the philosophical barriers to it, um, uniformity being one of the largest ones. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and he also greatly relied on thought experiments and hypothesis. Uh, in just generally in his, uh, in his life. So that's uh, scientific method part one. I have part two, how does it work? Uh, I talked about this a little earlier. Central hypothesis behind the scientific method, it, it, in and of itself, is a hypothesis. It's a construction, mm -hmm. oh, a uh, theory behind how knowledge works, <laughs> how we can come to learn knowledge. So if the scientific method works, we're inductively proving itself, uh, which is an interesting point. Yeah. The um, a central idea behind it is that ideas are cheap, but knowledge is expensive. Uh, this means you cannot simply acquire vast amounts of knowledge purely by thinking. You must uh, put in some elbow grease. You must be uh, actively experimenting and testing things. So uh, if ideas are cheap and there are lots of them, then how do we know if we get the right one? Mm -hmm. And this is where the scientific method is really an application for the search of the least wrong idea. Uh, searching for the most correct idea would lead to countless things to discover and no reasonable place to start. There would just be too much to think about. You wouldn't know where to start. And you probably wouldn't come to a great conclusion. So instead of uh, we search for the least wrong thing, since it only requires that I have an idea that explains the cause of a thing. <laughs> I don't need to start out with explaining the cause of everything. I can just start out with explaining the cause of one thing. And in fact, uh, Newton himself heavily criticized the idea of a theory of everything. Oh, good. Um, well, that's far back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, of course, this requires lots of frequent communication, frequent and broad communication. Mm -hmm. um, one person can't do everything, so we must rely on other people to help and support, uh, standing on giants, so to speak. Uh, the, and the printing revolution and literacy really, really helped there. Um, Cool. All right. So, so uh, I think we could take a deep breath there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. We we Does made it have, through. Have any questions yeah, about that? Like the history is way more broad and like deep. But yeah. anyway. So, okay. Yeah. And if you guys have a question, feel free to raise your hand and stop me. But um, I think it's a good point to take a step back from all that. If you guys were here last week, that was pretty much what last week was like as well. Um, it's really important that we understand the basics of that before we get into the practical application. Um, we're going to take this now and start to move it into theology and how this actually applies to our lives today. Um, the important stuff, really. But if we don't understand, especially uniformity like Cal was teaching, um, you can make very bad assumptions about what science can do and what it can't do. Okay? I would like to argue that science is one of the best tools for us to use to learn about who God is today in our world. Um, but we also have to realize that it's not our God and it is inherently limited by this idea of uniformity and the knowability of nature. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to start to break that down a little bit. Feel free to discuss and uh, you know, anecdotes that anyone has, feel free to throw them in as well. Um, as Cal said, the uniformity is going to be this term that I'm going to use for the idea that everything is the same right here as it is in Africa or it is on Mars, right? That if we have the same conditions, Right now, this piece of wood table, if we moved it to, to Zambia, it would still be a wooden table, right? That concept is inherently metaphysical. It's a religious belief. There's nothing that we can do to prove that. We can only observe it, all yeah. right? Mm -hmm. 
and this is why Newton himself had to write that book, saying right. rules for philosophy, not rules for science, <laughs> yeah, rules for philosophy. So, so it is a religious belief, and just because it takes place all the time, um, it doesn't mean that we can prove it. All right. Um, interestingly, the Bible makes this assumption, as, or not assumption, the Bible claims that is true, that uniformity does exist. Um, especially, the Bible says that we can find God through creation, and if, how would we discover anything if everything was random? Yeah, right? or, so, yeah, rather, why would we believe that we could understand God, right. who is himself uniform, right. through yeah, a creation that's non-uniform? Yeah, and specifically, God doesn't change at all. He's the most uniform exactly. thing ever, right? Exactly. So, um, so pretty cool stuff there when we start to figure out, you know, what does this mean? Um, but then the next application of uniformity is that it inherently limits science to, to the external world, right, of what we can see, and, and to things that are uniform. So what this says is it takes an axiom or a core belief, a religious belief, and says that if something can change, right, like let's say if this could disappear out of nowhere, if, if God could snap his fingers and that goes away, then it cannot be studied by science, right. Right, by definition, because it's no longer uniform. So, so that's that's the prelude here that I'm gonna that I'm gonna posit that we should be thinking about as we go into um, the application of what science can tell us and what can't tell us. I'm gonna have to apologize uh, up front as I get into this. Uh, there's a lot here, and there's a lot smarter people that have talked about this than me. So I'm gonna be doing a little bit more reading than I normally do. Um, I'm gonna get most of it from C.S. Lewis. And N.T. Wright specifically, and I'm going to give a little bit from, from that other book that I talked about. So, um, N.T. Wright does a really good job in, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember it's a book that he does this on. It's one of his books. I can tell you guys if you guys want to know. But um, he breaks apart the study between history and the study of science. And says that the difference between the two is the study of history is something that happened one time in the past, whereas the study of science is a study of something that can be repeated. Mm -hmm. All right. Very important key distinction there. Yeah. It's um, like uh, the study of history is like if you took the scientific method, but took out the ability to experiment. Right. Good. Yeah, good point. That's so you only have the ability to observe or have the ability to observe. Or to, uh, yeah. To so then you're a lot more limited to Aristotelian methods. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be a good way to say it. Um, so, um, so this is really important to recognize that we have um, no basis of our assumption for uniformity uniformity and it is purely an axiom of faith, right? It's, we have to assume things are uniform and that they will not change. Um, but just because that's observable and we see this all throughout history does not mean it's inherently logical. It doesn't mean that it can't be broken. Mm -hmm. That's the book Miracles by C.S. Lewis. That's an entire point of the book, all right? It's that we shouldn't assume that this is all of truth, that truth might be able to transcend uniformity, all right? Um, especially if God created uniformity for us to know about him. He has to be above science, right? He can act outside of science. Um, well, and also mm -hmm. just from observation, knowing that we have time, things can be uniform at a specific point in time, but they can't necessarily be uniform across time, right? That's how change occurs. Right. So uh, when we're talking about uniformity, we're generally talking about uniformity of the specific laws and uh, <laughs> causations of reality itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, why does you know why doesn't gravity change? Why doesn't the strong force change, etc. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's that's more the question of why don't they change? It's a very good question to ask. Um, so to apply this to something like like religion, I think is a really good way to see the limits of science. Um, specifically, N.T. Wright applies this to the resurrection, which I think is a great one to apply it to. So. He says, how, how many of you guys were in Pastor Bill's class at all when he talked about the resurrection? Some of them. I did a little bit too, but he did a great job of arguing for the historicity of the resurrection. So um, there's plenty of historical texts, and N.T. Wright um, argues with a lot of his, his contemporaries at Cambridge, or I think Oxford, I can't remember where he is. But, um, and a lot of them will admit that, that there's plenty of historical evidence to suggest that the resurrection took place. So what he would say, and I wish we could get into that more, but like I said, Will did a really good job on it in the past. Um, but he would say, if someone says to you, events like the resurrection don't normally happen, your response should just be, who says? Because there's really no reason to believe that uniformity can't be broken. Like, we can see that this table exists here, but is it possible if a God transcends uniformity that he could end uniformity, mm -hmm. right? Um, C.S. Lewis calls this a miracle. 
that that uh, the definition of a miracle. The definition of a miracle. Yeah, yeah. It's something that doesn't fall within normal. Yep, yeah, exactly normal. Like I said that. So um, so a break in in uniformity would be a um would be a a miracle, right? So um, I wrote this out here, and I think it summarizes it well. It's basically summarizing C.S. Lewis's belief, and I think we can break it down just, just slightly. So, um, what, what C.S. Lewis would claim in N.T. Wright and what I would claim as well. So, therefore, if all the evidence suggests a break in uniformity from a historical perspective, it would take a whole lot of faith for an axiomatic dogma to refuse the evidence based on the approvable assumption. So, I know that's, there's a lot of words there. But the point behind that is that if history and all of our evidence seems to suggest something like the resurrection took place, it probably takes more faith to believe it didn't take place than it did because of this assumption of uniformity that lies behind it. Mm -hmm. All right. What I'm trying to claim is that science, in a way, is just as religious as something like Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so our point then is not what are we going to, which one are we going to believe, the science or the religion? It's that which religion are we going to pick? And in reality, if you pick Christianity, science starts to make a whole lot more sense as well, too, because we can explain these concepts like uniformity, you know, why things yeah. are the same. We can explain why we want to use words. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, you don't believe in uniformity, then no word can mean anything. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So um, that's the big picture of where this is going that science is very limited. Um, some other additional considerations for that of how we can actually apply this to our lives now, right? Um, that there are two different types of science specifically, this, this method to look at inductive reasoning. There's historical science and observational science. And um, I would say the credibility of these vastly differ. So Cal is the one that brought this yeah. up when we were studying it. The Creation Museum, Answers in Genesis, they do a very good job of breaking this up if you want more resources. But like historical science is evolution. There is a lot of time between now and when they claim evolution would have taken place where there's room for margins of errors, right? If we contrast that to something like medicine, like if we're going to test whether Tylenol works, we can do that over and over and over and over again. And if we're assuming that uniformity take pl takes place, which as Christians we would say it absolutely takes place, we can prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that Tylenol actually does help you feel better when you take it, you, you know, have sickness so, um, or you're, you're in pain. So. That's an important distinction when someone makes a claim like you should trust the science, but they're talking about historical science. It's a lot more iffy than when they're talking about medicine, yeah. you know, along those lines. Um, yeah. So, yeah, time, time directly goes to the uh, effectiveness of science. Yeah. Science also, by definition, if we're just absorbing the external world, cannot deal with morality. It's not possible, so we shouldn't try. <laughs> a lot of people have tried, and I think that has ended in some pretty terrible... Things um, as we talked about a lot. Eugenics. Yeah, I was just about to go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eugenics, the World War II, the Enlightenment thought that with the the change in technology, how they were going to be able to gain all this power and subdue the world, that it would create a utopian dream. Um, and it probably and the, people say the death of modernity when post-modernity started was World War II because that was kind of the climax of where yeah, sure. technology takes you. Sure. I mean, yeah. The, <clears throat> Various French revolutions throughout yeah, the 1800s that's good one. were so you had heavily like Machiavelli who basically said we're all looking out for number one. Yeah, and that's basically what he said. Yeah. You know, and these guys came, oh no, no, we're going to be, we're going to look out for ourselves, but that, that ourselves are going to make a better community, and mm -hmm. they never, never allowed for the Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Bradley. so, yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of philosophy that went into politics that evolved into World War II, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Right. Well, if we've learned anything from Aristotle, it's you need to be careful about your generalizations. Right. Well, yeah, if right. you believe that every person wants to mo act morally good, right. then you're going to set up a society which is going to greatly enable people who don't. <laughs> right. 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 We all want to be good. You know, yeah. Virtue. Yeah. We all want to be virtuous. So. Not necessarily true. Not everyone. Yeah. Well, you know, just time to find virtue. Yeah. Did you know that Plato probably read some of the works of Moses? I never thought of that until I read it across some place here a while back. Really? Was, he may have. I mean, yeah. And who knows what makes sense? It makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Argument. Anyway, yeah. I'm fine. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get through this quickly. I don't know if you want to talk about the next slide or if you want to say that for next week, but I'll leave okay. that up to you. Um, last yeah. point that's very important is that science. Um, 
we should not be scared of it as Christians as long as we know where it's limited. So Romans 1.20 says that every, our, um, I wrote something wrong here. Okay, <laughs> basically the creation of the world and his eternal power, talking about God, and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through the things that he has made. Right? We can learn more about God um, through what he has created, and the scientific method is a very good way for us to learn about that. Yep. Um, so that's my conclusion cool. on that. <laughs> Any questions? No. Okay. So now we're going to talk about some of the applications of science. Now that we've talked about the limits of science, we're going to talk about a little bit of what science actually can do. Um, and a lot of this is kind of how it's structured nowadays. So mm -hmm. there's uh, two general concepts, one called fundamental research and one called applied science. Fundamental research is kind of that first portion of um, the scientific method where we're coming up with ideas, we're observing things, we're doing research. We're looking for like existing material that can help us understand and come up with better hypotheses. This is known as fundamental research or basic research. Um, and uh, yeah, there are many people who are famous for this. Um, usually because uh, if they're famous, it's because they wrote a book. <laughs> Um, so many like theoretical physicists and uh, you know people who have various thought experiments um, going on. Scientists, of course, who spend too much time in this part may come up with theories and hypotheses which are difficult to collectively verify. Uh, a famous modern one is like the inventor of string theory. Like, how do you even test string theory? There are some things that you can test, but it's like, well, if we invent that and that and that and that and that, then we can test it. <laughs> Uh, nowadays is known as the reproducibility crisis, uh, and it often arises from incorrect statistical inferences. Hmm. Um, so in like psychology or social sciences, um, people will try to observe a bunch of different people and their responses, or like even look at general statistics of like crime rates and whatever else and make inferences from that. And if you don't do your statistics right, you'll come to wrong conclusions every time. Hmm. Um, then there's applied science, which is much more on the experimentation side, the second half of the scientific method, where uh, you're testing things. You're coming up with experiments, you're finding ways of doing those experiments, you're inventing technology to help you do those experiments, and this is probably where most of the actual benefit from science has come from in the last 500 years, <laughs> I would argue. Uh, for example, uh, Johannes Gutenberg for inventing the printing press. That is applied science. He was using mechanics and, uh, in, well, and then inherently in that physics and whatever else, uh, and chemistry to figure out how to print books faster. Um, and then there are people who, of course, do both a lot, uh, but it's more common nowadays for people to generally do more of one and more of another because of specialization. Uh, and then there's a bunch of different branches of science, of course. Uh, you're all, I'm pretty sure, familiar with that. Um, and then the purpose of science. So as far as uh, it gets into applications, this allows us to um, really enjoy the benefits of the God-given purpose of science. By trying to apply science to our lives, we just naturally get those, those good consequences, so to speak. Um, uh, Probably the biggest one, I would argue the biggest one, is getting to know God more. Uh, it's the highest purpose, it's relational to God. And uh, there's a couple cool quotes I have. So I have another one from Sir Francis Bacon, which he says, God has, in fact, written two books, not just one. Of course, we are all familiar with the first book he wrote, namely Scripture, but he has written a second book called Creation. That's um, good. Yeah, and so I think that's super cool in that. By studying his creation, we get to learn more about the nature of God, uh, just like how we can by studying his scripture. Um, of course, we get to learn more about the world that uh, can help us develop technology or become more just uh, powerful relationally to it. It can be a very good thing for people like advancements in agriculture in the early 1900s mean that there aren't tons of famines. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and of course, we can develop technology with it, which um, goes with that uh, that other point. So, yeah, yeah, cool. That's kind of it. Um, um, any questions related to that? No? Okay. So yeah, uh, next week. Next week, um, we're gonna do. We're gonna talk more about uh, 
the implications of science next week, um, which I think is, I love the implications of science. We're going to talk about Nietzsche and the death of God um, with maybe a more uh, theological approach to the problems that postmodernism has, has given us. Um, like, we didn't talk about it too much today, but as we kind of alluded to with World War II and the death of modernity, these logical conclusions of the utopia that were supposed to come with the scientific method mm -hmm. obviously did not happen. Yeah. So um, does that mean that we should be all depressed and make up our own truth like the world has posited? Uh, I think I mean, Kyle will say no. <laughs> I think most Christians would say no. Yeah. So that's going to kind of be what we talk about tomorrow. Yep, exactly. Or next week. Next week. So, and that'll, that'll wrap up our series. Yep. Yeah, we're thinking about maybe doing um, the creation, different views on creation after that. Or yeah. um, th if anyone else has like a suggestion of what they, you guys want us to talk about, we're open to that too. But, okay. But yeah. So cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Uh, who is the